Kia ora koutou katoa. Good evening, everyone. After 102 days, we have our first cases of COVID-19 outside of a managed isolation or quarantine facility in New Zealand. We have been saying for some weeks it was inevitable that New Zealand would get another case of community transmission. This is a tricky virus. We have been working on the basis that it could be at any time and been preparing for that time. That time is now. The health system is well prepared and the important thing now is that we stop the spread of the virus in our community. One of the things that happened during the first wave of COVID was that lots of samples were collected of the virus and their whole genome was sequenced by the team at ESR. And a wonderful paper was published, luckily just before the second outbreak, which documented all the genomes that they had managed to sequence, which from memory I think was about 60% of the cases that we'd had, which was pretty good coverage. And that became a really rich resource. Genetics has really played a really important part in the entire, I guess, COVID story that's been going on. So very soon after a virus was identified in the Wuhan district in China, its genome was sequenced. So someone put it into a machine that spat out a, essentially, if you like, a book of 30,000 letters. That is its genetic code. Now that was then subsequently used to design all of the tests. New Zealand um, experienced its first uh, reported case at the end of February and very quickly um, my colleagues and I at ESR were, were chatting um, about sequencing the virus of the, the first um, case. And um, within days we managed to, to do that and from seeing what was happening around the world that this was only the beginning. Um, New Zealand was going to experience an outbreak here and cases start rapidly increasing. And we really wanted to be able to contribute to this sort of global uh, genomic data sharing that was happening in real time. And our aim was basically to sequence every, every case um, that we could in New Zealand. It turned out there were like 300 odd introductions at least of COVID before that first level four lockdown. And also meant that the capability was there, the pipeline was there to do whole genome sequences of any new cases that arrived. And so during the Auckland outbreak, some brilliant work was done in which every time we had a case, it was sent off for sequencing. The way that we've handled uh, this virus is slightly different than from what happens typically in infectious diseases, where the gold standard is to um, first culture the pathogen, which means that you put it into a specific medium or one of those petri dishes and then grow up the pathogen of interest. That allows you to focus very specifically on one pathogen. But that takes quite some time, several days typically, to get from a sample to a culture that you can then study. Um, so what we said is we want to go to a system where we can study the genome without needing such a culture. Um, this is something that they've been using in Ebola and Zika, where they um, took these sequencing machines down to those areas. We thought that if we want to inform decision making, if we want to inform contact tracing, we need to be rapid. We can't be one week behind because the way that this virus was spreading and how quickly it was spreading, that would be too late. Um, as we've seen with those lag periods um, in lockdown levels as well, um, it can really quickly get out of hand. It all quite came together reasonably quickly and my colleagues here at ESR are working extremely hard to do all the wet lab work and I was helping with the genomic sequence data analysis at the sort of other end of, of the pipeline. And very quickly everyone sort of banded together to do this. And so when, you know, we had a second outbreak in August, we were able to sequence and report on those cases within, you know, 24 hours of, of the outbreak being reported. When someone gets a test for their virus, they get a swab taken. And that first goes to a diagnostic lab where they determine if that person is indeed carrying the virus or not. All those cases that then test positive, they are referred to us for sequencing. So the large volume of testing is handled by the diagnostic labs and we do not see that. We just focus on those people that actually carry the virus. And what we then do is we take that sample that was taken from that individual 
and we specifically um, copy out the virus. So we use very specific, what we call sticky bits, or in, in scientific terms, amplicons, um, that specifically stick to the virus so that we can make multiple copies of the virus and that when we start our sequencing reaction, uh, we only um, read the viral genome and not the human or bacterial uh, bits that might be present. To give you a little bit of context about the major jumps in, 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 in how we sequence genetics, is that in about, well, in the year 2000, the first human genome was sequenced. It cost $4 billion and took a decade to complete. Now you can do it in a day for about $1,000. So in, in terms of, you know, to a geneticist, that was like taking away your Morse code machine and giving you a computer. That's the level of jump that we saw in technology and cost and utility over a very short period of time. There's a lot of lab work involved and we've been working really hard to try to minimize the time. And together with Massey University, they have developed a protocol which allows us to generate data from the moment that a sample arrives and having some useful sequencing data come out which is about eight to 10 hours, which is really quick and which has allowed us to respond so rapidly um, to those new incursions and to provide uh, rapid data. Relatively early on in the pandemic, a group of researchers cleverly came up with genomic nomenclature to basically name different lineages of all the samples that were collected from around the world. And this is a sort of dynamic system where um, lineages are constantly evolving and becoming sub-lineages and sub-sub-lineages. So it, it makes our job really easy, um, or much easier, when um, there is, say, a re-emergence event and we don't know what it's linked to. We can compare the genome of that case to all the other cases sampled from around the world. Um, but we can narrow in um, our search on that specific genome lineage. Mutation in any uh, organism, um, including microbes and including viruses, happens during the process of replication. Um, so basically mistakes um, during the replication process can lead to single changes in single nucleotides or bases within the genome. And it's that those changes over time that enable you to look at how um, isolates from different people, for example, are related to each other. You can kind of reconstruct the ancestry of those to infer whether they're likely to, to have shared a very recent ancestor or whether their ancestor was a long time ago. And it's that relatedness using those mutations that enables you to, to infer transmission, provided there's an epidemiological link between them as well. We communicate genomic data um, in something called a phylogenetic tree. And this is like if you picture a family tree and you're drawing the relationships between the family members in that tree. So we're connecting the relationships based on the genomic data of every virus sample and how they are related to each other. And from that we can infer different genomic lineages and how far back in time sort of divergence events of these different samples occurred. This is the first time during a pandemic um, that globally people are now integrating virological data um, with genomic data and epidemiological data to really inform the response um, that that governments are and, and policy decision making. And in New Zealand, we are doing that. The fact that our government acted decisively and is listening to science has meant that we have been able to make quite an impact with the genomics work that we do because it was actually informing decisions and it was also a number of cases um, where we could get near complete coverage. So for the Auckland cluster, for 85% of the people, we have a complete genome which means that we can also make slightly stronger conclusions because if you have missing data, it's always a lot harder to tell what's going on. It's only really effective if we can inform the response in real time, um, which means sequencing the genomes of cases as soon as possible. Um, and now we've achieved that within 24 hours, we can report on a, a, a genome um, of a case. And so, um, that has really in helped to inform the response, particularly in the re-emergence event in, in Auckland that we saw in August.
we were able to tell that the community cases were linked to this one cluster and all the subclusters that appeared were all linked to this one outbreak. There were, however, a case that was not linked, so we sequenced the genome and actually it wasn't the same as the ones that were circulating in the community at that time. It was actually linked to one that was from a quarantine facility and that person actually worked at that quarantine facility so had we could conclude that there was most likely a transmission event and then by combining with the epidemiological data we found out that these people had been in the same lift or in the same location at the same time and so that was able to to inform how that transmission actually occurred. So it's really combining um, the genomics with the epidemiological data that actually helps. In my role as Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor, I was at the daily briefings for the second Auckland outbreak, so there was a teleconference most days, and so I was able to see that some of the whole genome sequences were being used and along with Ian Town from the Ministry of Health, really encouraged that that was done systematically. And Ashley Bloomfield and Caroline McElnay um, were great at enthusiastically adopting those um, data and really understanding how they could, how they could improve the contact tracing. Um, but it was obvious that the system hadn't been set up to do that because this was cutting edge science and there was a bridge to be built between the contact tracing team at Auckland Public Health and the sequences at ESR. And luckily on our Chief Science Advisory Forum, Michael Bunce, who happens to be the Chief Science Advisor for the EPA, has a background in environmental DNA monitoring. And so he was the perfect person to really go in and look and make sure that the information was being used as efficiently and effectively as possible. So Ian Town at the Ministry of Health seconded him for a couple of weeks to go in and do a rapid review and really make sure that the system was working as well as it could be. This is really the first time, um, I guess, in the history that we've tried to integrate genomic data into a pandemic response in real time. We've always sequenced viruses in the past, that's nothing new, but we've not tried to sequence them and then make decisions based on what the sequence tells us. Like this individual might be infected from this church group. So that's the epidemiological link between those two. And so, um, that's new, and of course, when you're trying to do new things and trying to integrate two fields together, which is traditional epidemiology and contact tracing with genetics, we're going to have some, we're going to have some crosstalk and things that are not, not as smooth as we like. So I guess I got asked in my capacity as a, as a science advisor on the forum with Juliet and by Ian, um, is to sort of look under the hood of, of, of this and, and look at areas where we could do better, look at areas where we could smooth out that process. I think what we've been lucky in New Zealand is that we've got some amazingly skilled scientists who we've been working with, James Halliday from Next Train, colleagues at ESR and in our university system. And we actually have had quite a lot of investment in genomics research and genomics equipment in New Zealand over a long period of time. So that that meant that we were really quite ready for the challenge that COVID-19 has provided for us. And we had been following international literature and seeing, for example, in our own first case here in New Zealand, where the lady from Iran who brought, um, who contracted the condition there, traveled to New Zealand and was diagnosed here, uh, we were able to show straight away that the infection that she'd acquired had been acquired in the Northern Hemisphere. So it gave us an immediate sense of the geographic spread of how the COVID virus was spreading around the world. And we were able to show that most of the cases that came to New Zealand came from Northern Hemisphere sources. My research is focused on um, finding out why viruses emerge into new hosts. Um, of course, this occurred in the um, current pandemic we're experiencing. Um, we haven't yet narrowed down which particular species um, the virus jumped from into humans, but um, we know that there are viruses in wildlife, including in bats and pangolins that have a similar virus. Um, and this is the case with the vast majority of emerging infectious diseases, if not all of them. They have jumped to humans from animals and um, 
and the frequency of these species jumps um, is seemingly increasing. And so if we want to prevent future emerging pandemics, then we need to better understand why and how viruses jump hosts, um, at, at this, you know, and, and then trying to prevent that from happening. As we move into, I guess, 2021, and vaccines will come online, we hope, is that it's, it's vitally important, I guess, that we continue to sequence the genomes of these virus to see how they change. Um, whether it's therapeutics that we use in hospitals or vaccines that we bring in, we're going to start nudging the virus around in different directions. By that I mean we're going to start pushing it. It's selection. We're going to start putting selection pressures on it. In the same way that a flu vaccine that we get one year will actually try and will kind of force the virus into trying different shapes. And that's why we need a flu vaccine the following year, because different variants cat us, is that we need to continue to watch the the virus and how it's changing, and whether it actually makes some big jumps, whether um, different str strains of it form. Hardly anywhere in the world has been able to do what we've done in New Zealand, um, because we very quickly adopted that tool and very quickly upskilled the team. So it happens in Australia, and it's been done really well here, but we were really learning how the system should work as we were managing the outbreak. So for the first outbreak, not every sample was automatically sent for whole genome sequencing because it didn't seem to be a high priority in the middle of a crisis when people were trying to do the contact tracing and get everybody isolated. And I think what we learnt during the second outbreak was the huge value of cataloguing every single sample. And so that if we do have another outbreak, we can very quickly say it came from this hotel or it was at that port. The DNA narrative has really resonated all the way through this COVID story in New Zealand. It's, it's helping us do contact tracing through um, rapid um, you know, diagnostics. So now I see contact tracing through the genomics. Um, and so I guess many New Zealanders probably, probably aren't aware of the fact that that DNA and genetics has played a core part in, in, in uh, I guess, keeping the country state safe and keeping us, putting us exactly where we are at the moment. Wastewater analysis is quite an interesting one and one where ESR has actually been working for some time now with the New Zealand police on detecting drug products and residues in wastewater. This has built on quite a lot of work that our Australian colleagues have undertaken over recent years. So the theory here is if you have eliminated COVID from a particular geographic area and then you get a new signal from the wastewater from that region, that would give you perhaps an early warning sign that COVID had returned and there were one or more people in that area who were excreting virus. Genome sequencing in New Zealand is being used for uh, food safety, for example. Um, we're using it to sequence bacterial pathogens, and this is enabling us to understand where humans are getting infections from. One example being the pathogen Campylobacter, which everybody in, in New Zealand, I think, knows reasonably well. Um, it can come from chickens, it can come from other sources. And we can use genome sequencing combined with other epidemiological information to find out where humans are getting infected from. And that clearly informs control strategies. We can also use it for waterborne infections. Again, the Havelock North example was one where genome sequencing was used to identify the source. In that case, it was sheep uh, contaminating pasture, which was washed into the uh, water supply and infected people. And genome sequencing was really useful for identifying that as the source. About a year and a half back around Christmas, there were quite some people that got sick um, that was then traced back to a certain food item. That was also enabled through genomics because you can say um, the, vir the bacteria in that case that we saw in those people was um, all very similar. So they looked like they were all coming from one introduction, just like the Auckland Auglis cluster. Um, and then uh, based on those genomics, they could actually go to some of those producers and handlers of that product and check if that same bacteria was found there and therefore make that link between someone that is producing food and some people that got sick and that enables you to do a very specific recall 
because, um, of course, what you don't want to do is recall products that are not affected uh, because that's just yeah, lost produce. Um, so that allows you to narrow down very specifically on a certain area or a certain type of product uh, that can then be recalled. It's also important to mention that we're using these technologies for animal um, pathogens too. The other disease we're trying to eliminate from New Zealand at the moment is Mycoplasma bovis. Um, and genome sequencing technology has been really helpful in understanding how that's been transmitted uh, within New Zealand, when it arrived and how it's been transmitted, and that's directly informed the elimination response, in that case by MPI rather than the Ministry of Health. One of the things that we're exploring is if this could be used in conservation projects where people were talking to me about translocating kiwi to increase the diversity of the population. But typically that means now that they have to catch a bunch of kiwi and then translocate that and hope that they have gotten some diversity. What you could do is catch those kiwi, then look at their genomes really quickly in a fairly high level and then only translocate those that bring diversity, which because translocating them is quite a, an impact on those animals. And that's something where you might use more informed decisions. If we can do genomic surveillance well, we'll really enhance our public health response to deal not only with emerging and new infectious diseases that come along, so you can actually get on top of the curve and deal with those issues straight away, uh, but also to help us tackle some of the longer term endemic problems that we have in New Zealand in terms of infectious diseases more broadly. And those are viral as well as bacterial and protozoal infectious diseases too. And New Zealand has quite a few of those. There are now technologies coming along where we see that being in the hands of communities or in the hands of um, GPs or hospitals. Uh, where some of that work can happen a lot closer to the source and therefore hopefully have decision making also be more rapid and be more informed. One of the things that we've been working on is that one of the technologies also comes in a portable format and that's sequencing something at this very moment. What we've been looking in with some people in the team is what would we need to be able to make this portable and movable? And so what is sitting there is a very small GPU and that actually can keep up with the sequencing machine and analyzing that data as it is generating that. So one of the tests that we did is we had a sample of seafood that we uh, infected with a pathogen and using that setup within about an hour and a half we could detect that pathogen in that seafood sample. Um, and that is quite interesting because you can start to see applications in the field um, and it is really something that is also a lot cheaper because the complete setup that you see there is about 1,000 New Zealand dollars. Um, there's still the reagents that go into it, a bit like printer cartridges that is still expensive. Um, but the ability to get it up and running and to do an experiment becomes a lot more feasible and economically viable. There is you know, quite a lot of talk currently inside science forum as, as well as in government about actually let's, let's, it's time to actually centralise the, our capabilities, whether it's an agricultural disease of kiwi fruit, cows or even cowrie dieback or it's a human virus. It actually doesn't matter, the same epidemiological and genetic toolkits and health responses are needed in all of those examples. And I think what we can learn from that is, you know, we should have our preparedness is more than just, should just be about human health. It can be actually helping New Zealand and, and other sectors. And I think that's really where we should be uh, turning some of our focus to in coming years.